So let me welcome you for the first session of our tutorial, regular Monday tutorial. And um, I'm happy that our new member, new member of UFA, well, not really <coughs> completely new, but uh, relatively new, uh, will uh, give us a talk on a subject uh, he is most interested in, namely on statistical dialogue systems. So, Filip Jurčiček will be the speaker uh, of today. Yeah. Okay, so, thank you. So, I would like to introduce myself. I am Filip Jurčiček and I recently moved here to Ufal. I did my postdoc in Cambridge in the group of Steve Young and I work on statistical dialogue systems. So this talk will be basically on, will be mostly based on the work I did in Cambridge or the group did in Cambridge and it will be a brief introduction to statistical dialogue system. Uh, I will not present any new results, you won't see any numbers or graphs, it will be just introduction. Those who attended um, lectures of Blaise Thompson at Clara Winter School they will see, they will see <laughs> a talk which will be compressed version of the talks at Clara Winter School in some sense. I include some different work or and I simplify some of the things Blas actually presented. So the outline of the, the presentation. First I would like to mention the main components of uh, dialogue systems. Of dialogue system. Oh, yeah, that I go. And then I would like to talk about the different dialogue state and dialogue acts as we use them in dialogue systems. After that, I will introduce POMDP, partially observable Markov decision processes, which we use for modeling statistical dialogue systems. And within this approach, we usually talk about belief monitoring, which is a process of inferring information about what the user wants, about the user goal. Then I will talk about policy. Policy is a, pro a decision way how the dark system decides what to do next. When user says something, we have to make a decision, and the policy defines this. And then I will talk about user simulation which helps us to train statistical dialogue systems and I will explain why we use it and why we shouldn't use it. And finally I will provide summary of this talk. So here are the main components of a typical spoken dialogue system. It is composed yeah, of many blocks and the most important is well, this is not a component, but the part in this dark system is a user. And it starts with a user talking, in this case I will be most interested in speech-enabled dark system. So a user talking to a dark system using speech. And then there is a component of speech understanding, dark, the dark manager itself, speech generation, which generates acoustic signal, which a user is listening to and responds to. This is additional actions. So let me tell you something about speech understanding component. Speech understanding component is composed of automatic speech recognition, which transforms uh, input audio signal into word sequences. These word sequences are then processed by block of spoken language understanding, which extracts some meaning from the utterances. When these utterances are processed and meaning extracted, there is a component in dialogue manager which usually updates, this is called dialogue state update, and it, this component tracks all information necessary to successfully complete a dialogue. It is usually composed of uh, variables which stores information in a restaurant domain. For example, it can be whether we want, you know, what type of food we are looking for, for the area where we would like to eat, or additional constraints. Then there is the policy which decides what to do next. This is usually based on the inferred information. For example, if we know that we are looking for a restaurant, then we may decide you know, to ask what type of food the user is looking for, or actually ask for the area. And it depends on you know, what the designer believes that is more important, whether to ask first for the type of food or for the area of the restaurant. 
in typical dialog system, this is usually implemented using some call flow, or which can be represented by a decision tree and can be encoded in a piece of software using if-then statements. Finally, there is a block of speech generation. Speech generation first includes nature language generation, component of nature language generation, and this transforms the output DAO acts produced by the DAO manager into uh, sentences on a word level. Then there is speech synthesis which converts the written text into audio signal which is then played back to user. So, let me do some detour and I will give you an example of tangible implication we used to work in Cambridge. This application is about queries. It basically helps you to resolve. When you are looking for restaurants, bars, or hotels, you can ask this information system. You pick a phone, you dial a phone number, and you can talk to automated service. When you basically specify your request for a restaurant, hotel, or bar, then you can constrain your search by area, price range, or number of stars you are requesting from a hotel. And then, once you are offered a venue, then the system, you can ask for address, postcode, or a phone number. It looks like a very simple system. It's just query. You are querying just a database, but it turns out that even this is, it can be a rather complex task to solve this, the state of the art techniques. Here's an example of time for conversation. Here the system basically uh, say, says, you know, how may I help you? So we introduce, you know, it's an open question. And the user can say uh, what they are interested. In this case, they're looking for a Chinese restaurant. Then the system basically realizes that there are too many <laughs> Chinese restaurants in Cambridge, so it asks for more information. One of these is, you know, whether we are looking for a cheap or expensive restaurant. After that, you know, it realizes that there is probably one or two restaurants, so it tries to offer one of them. And user wants to confirm whether it is in the center, and the system confirms this information, and then user is happy because it is in the city center, probably is looking for something there, and then so it asks for a phone number, and the dialogue ends. As I mentioned, any the dialogue, typical dialogue system doesn't work directly with the word sequences. And instead of it uses some semantic interpretation of the input utterances. So in this case, we work with very sim with the semantic interpretation or using dialogue acts. In our case, it's slightly more complicated or different. Uh, yeah, here's an example of the first sentence on the previous slide. What we usually want to extract is some basic meaning, very simple meaning, not in the sense of semantic role labeling, as you might be familiar with. So, for example, in this case, we would like to know that uh, the user is looking for a venue, which is a restaurant in this case, and type of food is look, the type and the type of food the user is looking for is Chinese. And the uh, overall dialogue act type, in this case, we call it dialogue act type, very often it's called dialogue act. In other fields, sometimes it's called speech act, is informed. By this inform, we are saying that user is saying to the computer, he's informing the computer that it's looking for a venue of the particular properties. And here we can see the part of the dialogue, the previous dialogue, with some semantic information, with some semantic information. So as you can see, this is what we had on the previous slide. Here we can see how we can express if user is trying to confirm something. So we have specific dialogue act type for confirming something and user is confirming a slot area with the value center. And here we can see uh, that user is trying to request some piece of information from the system. So when we have a component for spoken language understanding, we are trying to always map this type of this sentence into this type of uh, semantic annotation. It's rather simple, but it turns out that it is uh, sufficient for the simple dialogue system we work with. Uh, there are many ways how to interpret uh, input utterances. One, based on DARPA communicator, is based on semantic frames. 
Here we can see interpretation of the sentence, show me flights from Boston to Denver. The semantic frames can include additional frames, so at the end we have a framework for something that resembles context-free grammars. And uh, so the complexity query is quite large. The previous approach has some benefits because it has a rather flat structure, so it is easy to operate. In the context of uh, DAPA communicator, there was always a very difficult to, to incorporate the input knowledge, the input parts, uh, into some dialogue state, into the context of the dialogue. In our case, in the previous intonation, it's usually very simple. Okay, so let me tell you something about the dialogue state. As I, mean, I already mentioned, the dialogue state is used to track the progress in a dialogue. So here, in the first turn, the system says, how may I help you? And our dialogue state can be very simply represented by, this, uh, by these three variables. And at the beginning, they don't have any information inside. So if the user says uh, that he's looking for a restaurant, which is denoted here by this dialogue act, then, basically, the simplest thing to do is just update one particular variable in the dialog state. And this we call dialog state update. There are some coming information, and based on the last user act, sometimes based on the last machine action, dialog act, machine dialog act, and uh, the dialog state, we perform some update. In second turn, user, the system asks, what type of food are you are looking for? And, again, it's rather straightforward to update the dialog type. If we have something like, for example, a request phone number after an offer by the system, we will have a specific slot that we will store the information that uses something requested. Once the system actually responds to it, it will change the, the slot variable that it was already responded to the request, so it won't happen again in the next turn. This approach to dialog state update is rather straightforward and simple. The problem is that most of the time that word error rate of spoken dialog systems in a real environment is rather high. Very often it is about 30% in word error rate. So it means that basically three words in 10 are usually wrong. And it can easily happen that will be the semantic most important dialog systems. In addition, SLU, spoken language understanding, makes mistake on its own because we don't have enough data to train, the grammar designer didn't do the job properly. Well, sometimes it's impossible. Some of the are naturally ambiguous, so we don't know, you know what the proper meaning is. So, and so we have to build in some ability to handle these ambiguity, these errors in the communication. They will be always there. There's an, exp uh, an example of an error that can happen. In this case, it originated probably in SR. User said, I'm looking for an expensive hotel, and we inferred that the user is looking for an inexpensive hotel, and we inferred that the user is looking for an expensive hotel. So, this is the type of problems we can have. When we look into it again, user said, I'm looking for a restaurant. We do the dialog state update, so we know what user is looking for. In the next turn, user says, inform stars five. Well, this is quite interesting because usually the hotels, they don't have stars. So there is some contradiction. This is usually what happens when we accept some input which is incorrect. That we have some contradictions or things that doesn't work very well. And don't, don't go along. So there are ways I know how to handle it, at least the previous approaches. They propose several techniques. First, the contradictions. So we see that, for example, if we infer that a uh, user is looking for a restaurant with five stars, then we will reject the information. So we can basically ask for confirmations. Or if we know that the sem semantic interpretation has low confidence, we can reject this information. But it comes with some problems. It's not an ideal solution. In statistical dialogue, spoken dialogue systems, we tried mainly to build robust and natural dialogue system. The robustness comes from two things. First, we are trying to accumulate information over multiple turns. For example, if I repeat something multiple times, then I should be able to make something out of it. If I just reject it, then I completely forget what happened in the past. So the system cannot 
get something out of it. Then we would like to accumulate information from n best list. We can have, for example, the top n hypothesis can be wrong, but because we have multiple hypotheses lower, we can get something out of it. And also, the naturalness would ideally come from learning from data. They would learn how people are behave, and we can learn this from data. So let me explain you or give you more details on the accumulated probabilities from multiple turns. Here we have, for example, input, which is an best list of two, and in the first, the most likely hypothesis is the user is looking for a restaurant. The second hypothesis that is looking for a hotel. If we were using the so the best hypothesis that we would use, we would think that user is looking for a restaurant, and or we might think, you know, okay, might not be correct because the probability is rather low. We are not sure about if we would reject it, so we didn't get anything out of it. In the second turn, second turn, we see this embezzlement. The top hypothesis is bar, and the second hypothesis is hotel. What happens is that. If we just use this second turn again to resolve our ambiguities, they would think that the user suddenly wants a bar. Here you can see geographical interpretation if you use some Bayesian approach. In the first turn, we think the user wants a restaurant. There is also some probability for hotel, a very low probability for bar. The probability for bar is because there is some prior information that there is possibility the user wants something even though it is not in our invest list. In the second turn, we can realize that even though user wants a bar, but because the there was two turns. User wanted the low probability hotel. Actually, using Bayesian rules, you know, we can infer that the hotel is more likely than, for example, bar or restaurant. And this we are trying to use. In, this sort of techniques we are trying to use in partially observable mass group decision processes used for spoken talk systems. Here is another example. For example, we have three hypotheses in our best list. The most likely is that we are looking for a restaurant, for cheap restaurant. So, and if we went with this, with this, we would probably reject it because it has a very low probability. However, if we try to marginalize the information on the slot types, we realize that this is more, very likely the user is looking for a hotel in a cheaper price range. Here you can see they're actually expensive. This combination is more likely than being cheap. So this is the sort of information we are trying to get. So let me now introduce partially observable, partially observable Markov decision processes. This is the same uh, figure as before, only here we assume some generalization. Instead of observing the best hypothesis from the component of speech understanding, we assume that we have multiple observations, each associated with some probability. Here we have a module which is performing belief monitoring, and it practically maintains a probability distribution over all possible dialogue states. Because we now we are not sure in which dialogue state we are, we have to maintain probability that we can be with all of them at the same time. And then, based on this distribution of the probability distribution over these states, we make our decisions. These are, can help us to resolve some ambiguities. For example, if we believe that we are in two states and there's some uncertainty and we cannot resolve it, we can ask for confirmation. We believe that user is, there is 50% chance that the user is looking for a hotel, 50% chance that the user is look, looking for a restaurant. So the best thing is to ask you know, whether the user is looking for a hotel or a bar. And if you have such action, they can lower our, our ambiguity in the estimate of the belief state. We can actually make our decision matter how our system more robust. Uh, Tom DP dialog measure can be divided into two parts, as I said, into belief monitoring and action selection. Each of these components is using its own approximation because in its simplicity the exact, exact methods for inference are not tractable, even for the simplest dialogue systems. And in the rest of this talk I will discuss some of the approximation techniques. In the belief monitoring, we aim at 
maintaining priority distribution over all dialog states. This can be represented as input O to put HMM. Here we have dialog systems actions. Those are these are things the, the dialog system says to the user. Then we have observations. These are things the user says actually. So this is how we informs the dialog system. And here is something that we call a state and distribution over is belief state. And we are trying to infer what user is actually saying. The problem with the observation is that they are noisy, so we cannot rely directly on the, on the, on what the user says. And the model, which basically, probabilistic model, which describes uh, the transition between the states and the observations and the actions is called the user model. And having the user model, we can do exact inference, and it's rather trivial. It's for, is like having a simple HMM system. There is only one extra condi item, you know, in this transition probability, which makes it different from regular HMM. The problem is that we have billions of dark states easily even for simple systems. Imagine an application where we have 10 slots and each value has, and each slot has 10 values. So we have 10 to power 10 distinct dialog states. So if you wanted to do the, use this update formula to maintain the distribution over all these states, you would run into serious problems. One possible thing is to prune the states. We would be maintaining only the most likely dialog states and we would forget about the, those low likely. The problem is that there are so many dialog states and uh, even those with low probability, they matter because they can sum up. So even after pruning, there would be too many and they still matter. Also, there is a problem if when we men try to describe the probability, transition probabilities between all those distinct dialog states. So researchers came up with different approaches to this problem. One is based on factoring the dialog states according to the concepts, and the other one is based on grouping similar states. And on the next slide I will explain the first. Here we can see the, an example of how we can factor a dialog state. This is a dynamic Bayesian network, and instead of having one hidden state, we now we basically we split it into multiple components, and we define conditional probabilities between those different components in the dialog state. For example, here we can see a specific node for type, which is, uh, for example, venue type. In our case, this is node food, which is the food type node. So, and we see that, for example, we are going, that the food type node depends on the type, and we are going to infer this one only if user is looking for a restaurant. For example, if user is looking for a hotel, we probably don't care what type of food they serve in the hotel most of the time. And using this factorization, this is the all inference problems, even the exact inference can be much simpler and faster. However, it is not still good enough. For the reason we are using uh, approximation, inf approximation techniques, for example, loopy belief propagation. The loopy belief propagation uh, is exact inference techniques on trees. However, if we have some uh, dynamic based networks which are not trees, then it's not exact. But most of the time it works reasonably well and it is fast. Also what we are doing, we are grouping some values in given concepts. For example, we don't have to infer probability of some information a user, user never mentioned. Because if user never mentioned it, there will be associated zero probability with the particular concept. So we do, we group all those concepts with low probability or zero probability into one specific group, and we assume that within this group, they all have the same probability. And when later in the, during the dialogue, user mentioned it, we just split them off of the, to, of the group portion of the dialog states or the values, and we are, assign some probability to it. So this is mainly mostly efficient when we have, for example, a system for um, transport information system. We have usually stops, and there can be thousands of stops, you know, for example, from and to. And instead of you know, maintaining probability 
over all ten th thousands of stops, we may pay over few of them user mentioned, or we think the user mentioned them. Also, there is one aspect that we can take advantage of. It is that we assume the probability of changing within the node are constant. For example, the probability of changing the user wants Indian to Chinese is equal to the user wants to change its mind from Indian to English. Because most of the time, user it's hard to infer in the first place. It's very hard to infer that there would be some difference in the change of the preferences, that you usually are more likely to change the mind from Indian to Chinese than from Indian to English. And if you notice, there are some efficient tricks that we can use in the inference algorithm. Hmm. Also, there is uh, uh, another technique which is based on grouping similar dialogue states. At first, we start with no information. We don't know what the user wants, and we associate the probability of one with this. If user says something, then we basically, and it has some probability of what we do, but we think that. So the user, there are two options. The user either wants this or doesn't want this. So we create the new goals, new goal, which is, which is matching the content of the input and something that it's, and it's complement. And we split the probabilities according to the input probability. In the second turn, what we can do, we see the user, in this case, user wanted a restaurant. In the second turn, user says that he's looking for uh, something serving Chinese food. So given some domain ontology, which usually we use you know, to constrain the possible dialogue states, uh, we know that uh, the food is compatible only with restaurants and we cannot be specified with anything else. So we basically split this particular group dialogue state. So now basically we think the user either wants resta Chinese restaurant or is looking for a restaurant which is not Chinese or is looking for something that is not a uh, restaurant. So instead of having all possible combinations of having Chinese or not having Chinese, having Indian, Italian, fusion, and so on. So we have only these three dialog states. And then the dialog measure can make decision only on the distribution of the probabilities, on the probabilities for these uh, uh, grouped goals. So again, this belief monitor is much more efficient than the naive exact inference on enumerated states. So, so far, we look into how we can maintain probability over all possible states, and we saw that it is not always tractable. Therefore, many approximation techniques are used. What usually happens because of these approximation techniques that some things are not possible to express. For example, in what I was presenting before, we can infer what the user is looking for, but we actually we don't store information about what the user is not looking for. For example, if the user says, I don't want Chinese, what we do, we lower probability for the possibility the user is looking for Chinese. But the low probability means that maybe we don't just, user didn't mention it, or we didn't hear very well. But we don't store information that we are very pretty sure the user is not look, looking for Chinese. So this is a problem. Also, within the nodes, we cannot store information about some logical forms. I would like to have a Chinese in the end, but I'm not interested in something. You know. Also, when we factor this dialogue state, in this way, we cannot store information that I'm looking either for Chinese restaurant or cheap hotel in the city center or bar which is not serving beer. This is not what we can do. But what we can do, still, you know, this, all of this we cannot represent. But we can basically guide the user slowly through all the possibilities. Like first, we will explain that there is only uh, there is no, what I said, cheap Chinese restaurant, and then cheap Chinese restaurant in the city center, and then you know, user will change its mind that it's looking for a hotel, and then we will explain that there is no hotel matching the requirements, and then we will move, we will find a bar which is not serving beer for the user. 
Okay, so now let me focus on the action selection. I'm so efficient. So, the action selection. So, as I mentioned, we, mm, the actions are selected based on the uncertainty in the belief state. So, we have to do all probability distribution uh, or its approximation of this distribution. I want to make some information some decision and ideally optimal decisions. There are two types of actions. One action can either move us forward in the dialogue in the sense that we get the, that we just make an offer to the user and try our luck. Or we can get another piece of information. We can get a new piece of information or we can try to confirm information. And the policy learning algorithms should be able to learn you know, when it's good to either confirm something and save some time in the future by the way it's one dollar turn or just get new piece of information or risk they will get something that is not you know, accurate or just make an offer and hope that user will correct us if user gets something that's not matching its criteria his or her criteria so First, I will talk about Markov decision processes because later I will tell you that this is very related and use and the techniques for Markov decision processes are useful for uh, the POMDP dialog systems. So, Markov decision processes are is a framework for decision making in situations where outcomes are first partially random and partially our control. Partially random means that. We can act intelligently, but the user is not constrained by this. But we assume some cooperativeness. So then when we either user cooperate or we can lure them into something that they are saying, that they can say us back something that is useful for managing the dialogue. In long run, we are trying to optimize long-term reward. We don't have examples of optimal behavior. It's not supervised learning. So we don't know what actions are good, what actions are bad. The only thing what we observe is something reward which includes number of turns in a dialogue. We are trying to make the, the idea is that we would like to have the dialogue as short as possible. In the sense that we don't want to waste our time asking questions which are irrelevant. Then we would like to have successful tasks. For example, if we are going to inform if the task is to inform user about uh, some venue, then of course we like to inform the user about venue the, the user is looking for, not just about some random venue. Also, we would like to maintain level of high level of naturalness. We don't like to be just machine efficient. We like to be natural and similar to users. This is probably the most hard thing to represent in the reward function. What usually happens is that this reward function is usually handcrafted. And if you give a user a task, we know we can easily measure how long it took to complete a task or to fail in the dialogue. To measure the level of naturalness is rather hard, so we usually ask a user to give us some feedback. The problem with this feedback is rather noisy. So there's another bit. The, uh, it's unsupervised learning technique, and also the rewards can be noisy, and it can affect the methods we are using. And noise in the reward function significantly affect the performance and the number of dialogues we need to uh, train a statistical dialogue system. Markov decision processes are defined on states and actions. Uh, for every, as I said, for every action A taken in state S, you receive some reward. Uh, this process practically repeats itself until the end of dialogue. Here is the graphical interpretation. Again, these are actions the system performed. Here are the responses of user. And given the state and the action taken, we observe, observe some reward. The reward is either generated by user or some automa automatically by some system. This reward can be delayed. For example, we sometimes we offer a reward which, uh, for example, in this case we can observe reward which is associated with the action taken in this state. It's never required that we have to only write the last action. If you had the, if you were receiving the reward and that would be associated with this action, it would be practically supervised learning. This is not usually what happens. Very often we see the reward at the end of the DAO. The DAO was successful or not. 
And what we are trying to optimize is some long-term reward. It is the sum of all the rewards. Yeah. So the f this way to explain reinforcement learning is on model-based reinforcement learning approach. As I said, we are trying to maximize this function. And what we know is the this model, which is the model of the environment. What it says is, what is the probability that how our actions affects the state? For example, if I ask the user for uh, food, the user is looking for whether the user is going to answer or not. If the user never answers, the probability is low for this, then this doesn't make any sense to ask this question. Also, it can happen the user never asks this question, but tells us another piece of information that is rather important for continuation of the DAO. So we can ask for food, but the user tells us, for example, you know, the price range. And this can work too. <laughs> so this is the model. And yeah. And this is rather important, uh, but later we will look into the methods that they can actually work without them. This model, because usually we don't have the access to it. We don't know how users behave, so we have to only look into the data we have we collect from users. So to get a dialog policy, we can define something we call a Q function, which is a officially named Q function, we, and it basically is expected future reward of taking action A in state S. In this case, it is expected reward because we don't usually have access to the re true reward, so we are uh, computing expectations. And uh, this can be roughly described as this. We start with some dialog state A, S, and action A, and from, from there we are accumulating some rewards. The only requirement is that we start in state S and A. And during the continuation of computation of this reward, uh, the, the dialog can move forward, so it is about the future. We don't want the action to be optimal only at a particular moment, but it would lead us to some optimal solution or good solutions later. So we can take some inefficient action, something that looks like inefficient, but it can turn out that we'll choose the path that will be efficient later. And if we have such Q function, we can com compute uh, optimal policy with respect to this Q function. And we can do it simply by maximization, computing uh, an action which has the highest Q value at a given state. So now basically we, have, we should look into how we can compute this Q function. And this can be rather, if we are having the, the model, it is rather trivial. We see the observations and we sum over all possible continuation and, give, and based on the probability of possible com combinations we accumulate the Q values. So we are moving from one state to another state, but we don't know how, how we are going to move there because it's partially random. So we have to compute an average over all these transitions. So when we come for a given policy, we can compute this Q value function. Then we can compute, again, the policy. And once we have the policy, we can recompute again to Q function. If you are going to iterate, actually, there are, some guarant there are guarantees that we will get at the end optimal policy. So there is a very simple uh, algorithm based on this idea that we are computing Q value function and then computing policies and Q value function and policies and so on. It is called policy iteration approach. The problem it is, as I mentioned, that we not always have uh, the model of the environment. So, but we have uh, some observations of the environment. So we have observations like state sequence and actions we took and the reward we observed. And having this, we can estimate actually the QL function. What we are trying to do in principle is to compute the QL function as expectation of the observed reward and then the plus the QL function. If we actually write it down using the samples, we will see this set of equations. And this can be solved using, for example, least squares. To get good estimates, we usually have to have more, a lot of data like this. And then basically it would be overdetermined system, set of equations. The problem with this approach is rather it's simple, can for very simple system can work. However, we cannot use it in for real applications. What we do, we assume that we can uh, tabulate the Q value function, that the, for every state and action, we can store one particular value. 
if we have billions of states, then we will have to store billions of Q values or the expected rewards, and it will not fit the computer memory. So there are attempts you know, to solve this problem, and one of the solutions is to approximate the Q value function by some yeah, approximation. In this case, there is an example of linear approximation of the Q value function. Here are the parameters theta, and the phi implements mm, extracts features from the state and an action. And having this, we can compute the approximation. What we can also do is to use some more advanced techniques like uh, regression techniques, for example, Gaussian processes. Gaussian processes is a regression technique based on kernel methods. And it was shown that these techniques allow us very quickly learn the value function. It also actually maintains uncertainty about the key value function. If we have these estimates and we have limited of data, amount of data, we might be interested into how sure we are uh, about the estimates. For example, if we are unsure about the estimates of the expected future reward, we might behave differently at that particular state when using particular action. Also, it helps us with modeling continuous states. In this case, we are very swing that the QV function can be tabulated. If there are continuous states, for example, some, if we would like to infer slot values and it would be price and would model it as a real number, then we cannot tabulate Q value for Q values or the expected reward fun rewards for all the real numbers or the real values. So by this approximation, we can actually solve this. So far, we considered only dialog state. However, we should work with belief state. We can show that belief state can be equivalently represented as a vector of real numbers. Have no. In the case that we have uh, discrete dialog states, then basically we need only one probability for each dialog state, and this can be represented as a vector of real values. So we can use uh, the MDP framework we presented before. Again, the problem is that in applications with reasonable large application we would have too many dialog states, so some approximation techniques has to be used has to be used. For example, we can use the linear approximation of the QL function and we extract some features from the belief state. And on the next slide I will tell you what type of approximation we can do. So the first thing what we can do is that we can factor the belief state according to the concepts. This is what we actually did already on one of the slides that we factored the belief state into different nodes. So instead of using the the whole vector or probability vector over all distinct dialog states, we can use only the uh, use as the distributions within those nodes and concatenate them. Also, instead of using the probabilities for each value within the node, we can use only entropy, for example. How important is entropy or what entropy can tell us? For example, if the entropy is low, so we are certain about its content of the node. Something is very accurate. So then we can make a decision, okay, let's take this information in this node, and we believe it. If the entropy is high, we probably need to confirm the content of the node, because we are not sure about what is inside. So, yeah. So then, basically, the vector of 10 to power 10 can be reduced to a vector of 10 values. Of course, we simplify a lot. Some things might not work in this situation, but it helps. So... The idea behind the previous approximation was that we use the most likely values inside the concepts. For example, some actions, so as I mentioned, the entropy, if there is high entropy, we should confirm. For example, if we infer the user is looking for a Chinese restaurant, then we never have to confirm whether the user is looking for an Indian restaurant. This information will be very likely always a suboptimal. It's better to confirm that a user is looking for a Chinese restaurant and can be used, for example, like implicit confirmation instead of explicit confirmation. So there is some notion of summary state space that is only some set of the belief, of the full belief state, and also the summary actions which uh, only confers only the most likely values or informs about the most likely values in the slots. Okay. 
So, so far I talked about the belief monitoring and, uh, and policy learning about the dialogue policies. The problem is that even the state of the art techniques, they are still, they still require a lot of data to train from. So they usually need more than tens of thousands of dialogues uh, to build a relatively simple dialogue system. And because we cannot get, <laughs> ask users to call our dialogue system you know, 10,000 times, because it's rather expensive, because if you want to hire someone and annotate the data and so on, you know, one call can cost you about you know, 50 cents you know, to one dollar. Easily. So it will be just too expensive. It will take too long to collect so much data. So we use something uh, we call user simulator. Sim user simulator is a piece of software which uh, simulates a user. So there is some framework behind which uh, takes into takes in, in the system's DAO act and then it responds to it. Sometimes you know intelligently, sometimes non-intelligently. Most of the, the simulators are currently handcrafted, however they are parameterized, so they exhibit more or less natural behavior, depending on the, it depends on the developer or the group, yes, what type of user simulator they have. So, in this example I can show you, the, for example, this the system says request food, food type, so it's probably, it already, there was some offer, no, no. Yeah. The user said that uh, he's looking for a restaurant. The system asked for what type of food we like. And the user simulator is cooperative and says that he's looking for a Chinese restaurant. So this is the sort of communication which is between the user simulator and the simulator and the dialog system. There are many different implementations, possible implementations. One of them is very simple, it's based, it's not very intelligent, it's based only on dialog acts. So in this case, they usually model transition between the dialog act types, and then they somehow randomly sample uh, the content of those dialog acts. Another approach can be based on agenda. Agenda or uh, push them automata were used in the past for dialogue system. So basically you, are pro you have some information, you would like to do something, so you push it on the stack. And then when you are performing some action, you pop it out of the stack. So if there are multiple things you would like to perform in this, so you push it on the stack, and later slowly you pop all this information from the stack. So it is one particular example of a simulator which is based on this agenda. Uh, on the some technology that was used in the past for, for dialogue system. Then there is, a, there is also a possibility to use the user model that we actually introduced before. Because we don't have to only use it for, to infer the user goal, we can use it, use it to sample. For example, this transition model, you know, model how user can change its mind. For example, uh, we can sample from this node, and this probability distribution tells us, you know, how likely is that user is looking for a bar, is going to change its mind that is looking for for a bar, and suddenly it will say, it will say, he will say that it's looking for a hotel. Here we and given the goal, this is how the user is changing the goal, and here this is the probability how user actually exhibits what he. What the user is thinking about. So, there, what can happen? And it models actually the noise channel. So it can tell a user is looking for a cheap Chinese restaurant, but on the output you can see expensive hotel. How this can happen? Yeah, because it can happen because of the errors, you know, in the in the channel of the speech recognition and the cellular. So, this is another type of user simulator. So, summary. So, uh, in this talk, I discussed uh, the basic components of a dialogue system. I introduced a very basic approach to the designing dialogue state and its update. This is sometimes called like information called information state update. And then I talk about POMDP, fra POMDP framework for spoken dialogue systems. Uh, I discuss belief monitoring, which is probabilistic way how to maintain probability distribution over all possible dialogue states. Then I talk about dialogue policies, how to 
design and how to learn them. And also I mentioned there's a simulation that we use to train our DAO systems. So right now. And hopefully in the future we'll be able, able to use real users. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. And I would like to invite uh, questions. Nino? Please do you think that some part of this dialogue system is language independent or? Practically, the dialogue manager is language independent. So you can use English trained system. You need just a synthesis. Yeah. If you have a transcription, a semantic transcription of the data, then we can use them to train the dialog systems. But this part is rather problematic because we still are working with the user simulator right now. Hmm. So what we can train with reasonable number of uh, examples, training examples, is the SR component, the speech, spoken language understanding component. The rest is still not clear how to do it you know, in an efficient way. But yeah, but for in terms of development, if you need to hire some students, so people working on uh, belief monitoring or policy learning, they don't have to really know much about the, the language of the application. Yes, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the real world uh, order rate of thirty percent. Mm -hmm. Uh, I assume that was a figure for English. Yes. And I understand you are starting a project with Czech. Right for include Czech too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's your experience? Uh, I mean, do you think or do you know that number is going to be similar or maybe worse? Or? Well, I think it will be can be similar. Yeah. Okay. Well, it depends on many aspects. It depends on the quality of the audio, it depends on the amount of audio data you have, how hard you try to build a good speech recognizer. The truth is that in spoken dialogue research, we are not trying very hard you know, to have the best possible ASR system because we would need you know, the low performance to show that our techniques in spoken dialogue system actually work. Because if we had perfect you know, SR, then there would be practically no ambiguity in the input, and then it would, it would be rather hard to show the advantages of POM DPs. I think you would still have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, ambiguities on, on other levels. Now, if, if you have words, yes. you still don't have the meaning. <laughs> no, 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 yes. yeah. yeah, in general, we are trying to have good SR, but it doesn't have to be perfect. No. So no, no further questions from the audience? Well, if not, then I would like to thank you again for your uh, talk. I think we have seen uh, inside the dialogue systems. Um, I mean, what are, the, what are the possibilities? And for me, it was a kind of I don't want to say science fiction, but uh, something uh, that I can't imagine how it can work together. But you say it does, so I do believe. Oh, yeah. So thank you very much once more. And I would like to tell the audience that actually I'm, well, I'm very, very happy to tell you that uh, our program till the end of this uh, term is now fixed. The only Monday which is not fixed and which will be free, is next Monday. So we have no seminar next Monday, but all the Mondays after then, uh, except for the two Mondays which are in between Sunday and a holiday, where we also don't plan any seminar, I think that's rather practical. So uh, all other ma Mondays are now fixed. And if you look at our board uh, on the just opposite the the elevator you see the program for the next four uh, seminars so I hope you will like the rich program we have 
and I'm looking forward to see you here, not next Monday, but the Monday after that. Thank you.